Welcome, everyone. I hope this will be a, a good experience for those who have a lot of uh, background in DNA, as well as those who are very new to it. Uh, and so the two folks talking uh, prior to our more open conversation uh, represent those those two poles. Uh, I have, you know, I don't have a professional background in this, but as a uh, you know enthusiast, I have looked into and done my own uh, internet research, which also can be dangerous, on uh, all the aspects of uh, DNA and tried to get an understanding of that. Um, I'm going to share that knowledge. And Ellen, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Ellen Matloff, and I'm a certified genetic counselor. I was the director of cancer genetic counseling and testing at Yale for many years before leaving to start a company called My Gene Council. So for those of you who are interested in genetics and genomics, please feel free to follow us on all the social media platforms. Great. Uh, so I'm going to start with a uh, presentation. And you should be uh, seeing a full screen presentation now. So uh, this is uh, so this is the two of us as introduced. And just as a disclaimer, uh, I'm not an expert in biology. Uh, this is my personal experience. Um, there are certainly mistakes and overgeneralizations. So don't take any of this as advice. Uh, do your own research. So in my own journey, trying to understand uh, what's in uh, all of this and what I can get out of it, I had to come to an understanding of DNA and. As you might all be familiar, you have uh, 23 chromosomes. Uh, this is a picture that's probably familiar to you in these, these funny little bundles. Uh, and to break it down, those chromosomes live at the nucleus of a cell at the very center. You can see uh, the little zoom in there and they're wrapped up and they have these long chains. You often see it as the double helix. Uh, there's also another type called mitochondrial DNA, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. But it's not just in a strand. Inside of those chromosomes, they are wrapped around uh, these other proteins, these other molecules that uh, inhibit or allow uh, the transcription to happen or basically for that DNA to become active or inactive. So there's a large portion of your DNA, which is a tremendously sized molecule, which may not be uh, acted on uh, depending on the circumstance. And I think just to give a, like a visceral sense of these, these beautiful animations, and I'm gonna show you guys uh, one here of what DNA looks like from uh, the perspective of an individual strand being now um, coiled by these various molecules in the body that organize the, the DNA. And as you scale out, you can start to get a sense of just how large this molecule is. And it becomes tightly packed into those things that we know as the chromosomes, which as chromosomes, they become large enough that you can, more, uh, you can see them in a microscope, where DNA is living at the molecular uh, atom-sized scale. And here we see the coils upon coils upon coils. which put us at that, that chromosome scale. Uh, so thinking about it at the atomic scale, there's the typical double helix that you see to the side there that is uh, often portrayed in uh, you know, media and lots of formats. But what that really represents is the one to the other side where you can see the actual atoms uh, forming these uh, molecules uh, structured by sugars. And there's these, there's four of these molecules, um, each which interlock only to its partner. Um, so there's adenine, uh, thiamine, and those lock together. There's uh, guanine and sadahine, and, uh, sadahine. Um, so they, um, they lock together. And so those get noted is TCAG based on their first titles. So you'll see in a lot of the DNA 
um, documentation, those initials representing those pairings that get put together in a DNA strand. And this video, um, I think is really interesting because what it shows is how that becomes uh, useful to the body. So the, this DNA locks up this information. These different pairs are coding information, um, just like your hard drive codes information, but it has to be turned out and it's turned out in the form of RNA. And so here you can see, uh, it's actually like a little zipper inside this protein that's opening up the DNA and it's the RNA is forming, it's being built by molecules locking into the little places where it can in the DNA, the DNA is being recombined and the RNA like a ticker tape spool is being thrown out of that protein and now available as instructions for uh, building proteins. Um, oh, it seemed to have repeated the video. Trying to get to this one. Uh, and I think it's really interesting to kind of consider then how this RNA converts. So it's, it's too detailed to go into, but just to get a depiction, uh, it will go into some sort of uh, building block protein enzyme. And as it comes out based on those instructions, the natural attractions and repulsions within the atoms uh, start to fold it in a very specific way. And so it looks like a random spurting out of these atoms uh, is actually very organized and is able to build very specific structures, which are in fact the structures that are doing all of these. So the body's an incredible thing filled with all of these uh, microscopic machines. And that gives you context for how uh, one change in that code can have profound effects. And so that one change here, so when you're thinking about that DNA change, you have this long, we're depicting those uh, chemical relationships as G, C, A, T, and so on. And most people, um, in fact, most animals, most things that are alive, share a tremendous amount of that code. We are more the same than anything else. But occasionally, uh, some of these nucleotides, those, those chemicals, will actually have a difference or a polymorphism. Uh, and those are called single nucleotide polymorphisms, basically a single difference in the DNA strand. It's short formed as SNP, and you'll see that a lot. When we look at what our tools are for investigation, we have a couple. You may have seen on like CSI, uh, there's something called fingerprinting where you can use chemicals to actually break down and visualize something at a human scale. Uh, there's genotyping. And in genotyping, you are picking out those typically those SNPs, which it, you can see are the colored ones in the long chain, the differences between people. Then there's also a sequence. A sequence is where you take all of the data that you can uh, get entirely, including the quote unquote junk data that is uh, not typically included when you're doing a targeted search uh, for specific things that you think are important, which is what you're doing in a genotype. And then you have uh, you know, sex-linked Y chromosome and mitochondrial uh, DNA, which follows you know, the male or female lines and are useful uh, for other purposes. So just to give you a little sense of, this is a, a shout out to the folks in the bio lab at Makehaven. Uh, this is Nora, one of our volunteers, and she's actually doing DNA fingerprinting. This is where she took uh, some cells from her cheek, she used an enzyme to break up that DNA, she used a chemical to add fluorescence to that DNA and then put it through a gelatin substance where it was attracted to, uh, to uh, an electrical uh, difference, which allowed those molecules and the smaller molecules move faster through the gel than the bigger molecules. And you actually get a physical uh, fingerprint that is can be used to identify based on the way that you broke up the DNA, uh, the enzyme you used, as well as the, uh, the person you're doing. But what most typical commercial packages are, are they're the genotype, they're the most common. So 23andMe is the, the most known. There's other ones based on MyHeritage and you will get a, a kit, you spit into this little vial uh, after making sure you don't eat anything. And what happens is it goes out and it is put on a silicone wafer 
which has millions of these little tiny dots uh, that have what are called probes that can actually combine. They're like DNA themselves. They combine with the DNA and they allow a fluorescence to be added. I'll show you a video in just a second, but there are each of the commercial packages uh, might be using different chips and different versions of the chips as they've progressed over time. Uh, you'll see just like one measure is how many SMPs they are analyzing, but these chips can also be um, customized for different ethnicities. Uh, they can be customized to look at different types of like optimized for health or optimized for looking at uh, athletic performance or ancestry. So there's different chips that are optimized in different ways. And that's one thing that you can look at as a consumer. Uh, here you can see this would be your uh, DNA stuff that you, you deliver, the cheek, uh, goes on a chip, goes into the machine, and um, on the top, there's you know hundreds of thousands of these little balls, these little molecules with these microscopic probes, and the DNA will attach to that probe. Uh, each of these probes has a, a different, uh, you know, each of these balls has thousands of these different probes on it. And with the combination of your DNA, you, they will wash it with yet another uh, chemical, which allows it to fluoresce. So these fluorescent molecules will attach depending on the chemical composition. And this will result in green, yellow, red, other uh, hues coming out of each of the, the indicating balls. What results is this kind of like, a, it looks like static on a television, but what this represents are the signals for uh, what response, what DNA um, compound is in your DNA for each one of the indicators that they're testing. So when 23andMe does that, then they produce some reports that are uh, pretty beautiful. Here's just kind of a selection of uh, pulled from mine. Uh, you get some ancestry. I happen to have a lot of uh, British Irish. Uh, you get what are called maternal and the paternal haploid groups. These are those trackings of the Y chromosome and the uh, mitochondrial DNA. Uh, you can see various relatives. Uh, my mother, who's actually on the call here, you can see uh, reassuredly that we are 50% uh, of our DNA is shared and 23 segments, so 23 big chunks are uh, completely identical. And then you get down to my sister, um, and, you know, with the random distribution, she's near 50, but a little less, according to 23andMe, uh, and she has more segments. So you think about, I have a, that there is a different random sorting that recombined to make my sister, and so less of those segments are going to overlap. And you can see, um, you can learn a lot about your relationship to folks uh, based on how these segments and the percentage of DNA. Uh, and it, it, with the ancestry, one thing to think about is it's not, they start with 500 years back in time, which is British Irish, but actually, uh, you know, peoples have moved and the story is much more complicated. So you can see that further back, there's some, you know, French German, and even further back, there's some Neanderthal. Uh, so you can get a deeper story about what is, is happening. Um, so uh, a tosmal DNA uh, is the kind we typically talk about. That's the, uh, you know, the the 22, um, you know, the main set of chromosomes that you have. And you can see that you have many, many, by the time you get to you, you have many, many people that have recombined in random ways. And that's depicted, this is actually a picture from 23andMe showing, you know, the grandparent, grandchild uh, relationship. And here's just another breakout of um, it from 23andMe showing, uh, my sister and I, where we can actually go in and compare specific segments and what came across. And this, of course, could be then correlated to various traits that are known uh, or there we're learning about because each one of these positions of the SMPs that they're looking at have some documentation to them. But there, I also mentioned there's the sex chromosomes. So the one we all are most familiar with is the Y chromosome. Um, so unsurprisingly, there's this recombination that happens uh, between the two partners for most of your DNA, but there's one that does not recombine because it can't, because uh, the woman does not come with a Y chromosome in order to recombine. So each Y chromosome is passed father to son identically. 
Uh, you don't get one from your, uh, your mother's grandfather. You always get it uh, male to male passing down the line. And this makes it an interesting thing for being able to track over time. Essentially, each Y chromosome is a clone. And therefore, uh, small random mutations can be tracked. And we can use it as almost a clock because those random mutations happen at a pretty regular interval. And we can understand more where that direct line of, of males uh, has come from. Now, there's a, another one that follows the direct line of women uh, going back through time. Now, you lose the ones that aren't in that direct line, but uh, mitochondrial DNA is passed uh, mother to daughter and actually mother to son. It just dead ends at each of the sons because they don't pass the mitochondrial DNA on. And the mitochondrial DNA is really interesting because it's part of the very early when we were before we evolved into multicellular organisms when we were very um, you know the very beginning of life. Um, it seems that there was some sort of symbiotic relationship. Perhaps it started by one cell eating another, uh, but an independent cell uh, became so interconnected with the other cell that it lived inside and it started producing energy, and they became. Um, you know, symbiotic in, in a way that has lasted throughout the whole animal kingdom. And that is the mitochondria. It was once its own cell. And therefore, it has its own process. It has its own DNA. It lives outside of your nucleus. So we are, um, you know, a combination or an amalgamation of these two uh, ancient um, evolved entities. And because it, it is reproducing itself uh, by cloning, uh, it also can be traced back just like the Y chromosome and we can get a lineage for uh, your maternal line. And there's lots of documentation you can read about uh, how these lines work and get this sense of deep history. Uh, so what did I learn? Uh, this is a screenshot of my raw data from uh, 23andMe and you can search for uh, various genes and see what you have. But at the time, when I did it back in 2015, uh, 23andMe was not allowed to provide health information. And so I had to download my raw data. I did that here. And it was provided in this format. You can see this is a little just text segment uh, where it gives you this RS value. So that is the um, RS stands for the, uh, I think it's reference SMP. Uh, and then it has a reference number. So these, they try to make them universal. The I ones haven't been, those can be like proprietary. There's, there's a, a few different ways to reference uh, SMP. It tells us it's on chromosome six and then it's placement is the other number. And then it's telling us what, um, what we have as far as the marker in GNA, is it G-A-C-T? Uh, so I downloaded that data and I knew there was this uh, SMP database so I could learn about various, uh, various SMPs and their effect. Uh, SMPpedia has a whole bunch of information. A lot of it connects to national health information and so on, but it's like a Wikipedia for uh, what the effects or the research is about these. Uh, but I needed something to connect it. And for that, I use uh, Prometheus. So this is a uh, piece of software. Uh, you know, at the time it was a very, you know, hobby piece of software and you could download it to your own computer and run it, uh, or you could run it in the cloud if you trusted their Amazon service uh, with your DNA. So you download your DNA from 23andMe, you upload it here. It has various dials that allow you to look at like the magnitude as rated by uh, participants, the uh, frequency that happens in the population, the number of publications that cover it, uh, whether it's good or bad, these sorts of things allow you to really narrow down the information that is in the SNPpedia specific to your responses. Uh, and here's where I found that I had this thing I'd never heard before called hemochromatosis. Um, and uh, eventually I printed it out and took it to my doctor who looked at me with great skepticism. Um, realizing that I would brought it from the, the internet and sort of wondering about the, the clinical validity of the 23andMe data, which I'd looked up and it's, it's very, uh, it doesn't make a lot of mistakes. Although wisely, he uh, verified it through his own medical uh, processes, uh, found out it was in fact correct. And, uh, you know, we, we made a discovery. So 
what is it? It's it's on um, on chromosome six. There is a single change in a DNA base pair in you know in my particular case. And what it does is for most of us when we have iron in our uh, diets, uh, your body is absorbing it. And there's some point at which you've absorbed enough. And so it turns off the uptake enzyme and it stops absorbing it, it blocks it. And okay. you, uh, that's how you regulate your intake of iron. With somebody that has this mutation, uh, the stop button is not there. So you're, you're taking in iron like normal and you just keep taking it in no matter what. This can result in uh, damage to your, um, to your organs over time and can shorten your lifespan. Uh, there's some conjecture around it, so this isn't certain, but uh, a lot of one of the theories is that this was actually protective during the bubonic plague. So the bubonic plague is uh, very iron hungry. And if you were a person who had this gene and was were constantly absorbing iron um, from your digestive tract, you actually were starving uh, this pathogen, which killed at one time 50% of the population. So you can very quickly see how a minor mutation would actually become dominant within the, the population. And I believe it's uh, actually among people with uh, Celtic descent, it's around 10% that have the thing. Fortunately, there is a easy, um, easy way to solve it through the uh, very modern uh, technique of just removing blood. Uh, if you just remove blood on a fairly uh, regular basis, uh, right now I'm doing it quarterly at the beginning, I was doing it every couple of weeks, uh, you are able to uh, prevent the negative con all the negative consequences. You have a normal, you have a normal life. So just getting rid of iron is enough. Uh, unfortunately, as a side note, I have to do it at Yale New Haven Health um, because the American Red Cross won't accept blood from someone who's receiving a benefit, uh, which is unfortunate. Other blood centers like the New York Blood Center have found a way around it uh, in that they do interview for your health things after they've given you the therapeutic benefit of taking your blood, and then they can go and, and use the blood. I would hope they can find a way around it because it is a shame that they throw it out and folks who have hemochromatosis will be regular uh, blood donors and obviously contributing to the supply. So one thing to think about is like, what is that like, how did this happen? Um, it, hemochromatosis is a recessive gene, uh, meaning it doesn't physically express itself unless you get two copies of it, uh, which is what I have. So it tells us something about our parents. Um, both my parents had to be carriers of that and uh, we're not expressing it. So we, we know that now. And that means that their children, uh, you know, one in four would not have it at all. Uh, two and four would be carriers and one would have, uh, this is at random, this doesn't necessarily mean this is how it works out, uh, but would have the, would express it like I do. And then thinking about for, uh, you know, the future of my children, what could be the outcomes? Well, of course, if I found somebody who was a full carrier, uh, which is relatively rare, 100% um, would have hemochromatosis and therefore be very good blood donors. Um, if I was partnered with someone who had it as a recessive trait. Um, all of the kids would have at least one. Um, and so you'd have two carriers and two expressing. And if I happen to uh, partner with someone who is uh, does not have it as a recessive gene or at all, uh, it would be 100% just recessive with none expressing any of the, um, you know, the, the active parts of it. So you know, just some further exploration, uh, you know, what did I do after this discovery? So obviously I was an advocate and this excited me uh, about the technology of DNA and what it can do for you. You know, essentially it uh, saved my life or extended my life, uh, which is an incredible outcome for just investigating myself. Um, and you can investigate your family tree. So there's, you know, as I mentioned, predictable ways that uh, the DNA recombines. And so you can find all sorts of stuff. My mom has been working a lot on this. A 23andMe has a map where you can get a sense of like other people where they live. Um, there's also, you can upload your information to GEDmatch, which uh, provides this information on things like the, uh, the length, which is the CP number of uh, how much matches up and where's the overlap and the largest segments. I took it even further um, 
following um, doing what was a full sequence. So the full sequence was incredibly expensive when it was first done with the Human Genome Project and has been dropping following Moore's law. Uh, I went a little further, waited for sales and was able to get one for $200, which is uh, you know, around $500, $600 is, is more typical. Uh, I use something called uh, Dante Labs um, and I was able to, they sell additional reports. So there's a, you know, there's a profit motive there for them once they get the DNA, but they do allow you to take that raw information. And there's several ways that they provide that information. Um, they break out the individually important things in smaller files. So there's insertions or deletions. This is where a whole section might be added or removed. There's the single SMP, so small changes. Uh, there's sometimes there'll be a section that has multiple copies. Uh, of a whole section, uh, which can represent an error and, and so on. Those are uh, copy number variations. Those are provided in different formats, or you can get the FASTQ or the BAM SAM, which give you your full, uh, full information in various formats that can be used elsewhere and analyzed. And like, where can you analyze them? All over the place. There's a whole litany of these places that uh, are now providing all sorts of advice, whether it's about what kind of drugs will work best for you, what sort of uh, athletic uh, training you should do, how you can find family, uh, all anything you can imagine is uh, there. And of course, you can discover early health issues like me, um, connect with lost relatives, learn your deep ancestral history, but there's also concerns. Uh, there could be shock from what you learn if it's a particularly bad health outcome. Uh, there could be discrimination. People are concerned about uh, insurance, uh, particularly life insurance does not is not covered right now by uh, the Genetic Protection Discrimination Act. Um, there's uh, corporate profiteering. Everybody, this is a land grab. They're trying to get your genetic information and make drugs and make money off of that. And there's always the possibility for some sort of discrimination to happen based on uh, health or your uh, background, which is is not something you want. Uh, but there's also a lot of social benefits when you think about the potential for society in sharing this information. Um, there are several projects that aim to uh, collect massive amounts of information, sometimes combine it with survey data feedback, cure diseases, uh, understand the interaction between genetics and lifestyle, and just make scientific progress. So I don't want to just... Um, talk about the, you know, the concerns and the ailments you discover, but also the potential for curing those ailments and uh, having a better future. So to note uh, in, in closing um, that DNA Day is April 25th. That's actually what uh, sort of inspired this session. And these are things that you can, this knowledge, this power, uh, and this potential are all things that we can think about and celebrate on April 25th as DNA Day. So that is my, um, my review. Uh, Ellen, do you want to talk? I do. Thank you, JR, and great job on the overview. Can I share my slides? Uh, yes, let me let me find you on here. Just be able to share now. Okay. Great. Okay, so again, my name is Ellen and I'm a certified genetic counselor. And I want to go through some of the issues with direct to consumer testing. And these are issues that I have written articles about in Forbes. So I'm gonna show you the covers of those articles because if any of these areas are areas you're particularly interested in and you want more depth, please check out these articles. But I actually went and spoke to JR a few years ago about his journey with direct-to-consumer testing. And one of the things I took away from it is that healthcare care providers can't afford to ignore DTC testing. And so this is what I advise physicians and healthcare providers who are used to saying like, oh, those kits are junk, throw it in the trash. You really have to acknowledge that patients have had testing and explain that most direct-to-consumer testing is not as accurate or as thorough as medical grade testing. In fact, it can be inaccurate up to 40 to 50% of the time. And one of the ways that it's inaccurate is that it's not as thorough. So for example, 
If you do 23andMe testing, they do return some of the BRCA1 and 2 information that stands for hereditary breast and ovarian cancer, but they actually share only three variants and there are thousands of variants possible. I always say consult with a certified genetic counselor if you are interested in genetic conditions in your personal history or your family history. And as JR's physician did, help that patient repeat the testing on a brand new DNA sample through a medical grade laboratory. I refer to some of these companies as genutainment. They're entertainment genetics. They can provide you with helpful and even life-saving information, but they can also miss a lot and sometimes they get it wrong. But we can't ignore at-home DNA test results and we shouldn't. But you should know that there's a huge range in the accuracy. Some of it is absolutely gold and some of it is garbage. And in fact, a genetic counselor, um, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me come back to that and say that if you look at 23andMe, the trends in the last year and a half, it's trending down. Fewer people are having genetic testing. And it was, um, there was a SPAC that recently purchased 23andMe. Ancestry.com also trending down in terms of number of kits sold. And it's important to know that another company bought a huge stake in Andres Ancestry for $4.7 billion. Why did they pay that much for their stake in Ancestry? Because they want your data. And so I think this is one thing to consider that even if you had testing, you trusted the company, a lot of these companies are being acquired. They've also discontinued Ancestry Health for those of you who would use that service. There are other companies like Color Genomics and Invitae that will send a kit to your home and you can order it online. And for most of the things they do, it's pretty accurate. Then there are companies like Origin um, and a genetic counselor named Katie Stoll wrote about her experience with Origin on the DNA Exchange, a blog that you can go to. And first she sent in her dog's DNA and got a human report. And then she sent in water, no DNA at all, just water. And they gave her a report on her tap water baby. So be very, very careful when you're ordering genetic testing. It's not all good. So one example that really woke me up, and I'm sure some of you remember it from a few years ago, was the Golden State Killer. This was a man who had raped and or murdered a huge number of women in the state of California back in the 70s and the 80s. And DNA samples were collected from the sites. Those DNA samples were stuck in vials, which were stuck in a filing cabinet and sat in the back of an investigator's office until he retired. And then a new investigator took over the position and took over the office, opened up the filing cabinet and was like, oh my gosh, what is this? This is a cold case. And so someone got the idea to take that DNA and to sequence it and then go to an operation that JR mentioned that was at the time owned by a couple doing it as a hobby in their home in Florida. And what you could do for free is upload your DNA sample. And if you were adopted, they would help you with their database, find your biological relatives. Well, without disclosing their true intent, they updated, they uploaded the DNA of this um, criminal and they found that he had a lot of relatives in their database. And so they were able to sketch out who his relatives were and the police officers using the branches of the family tree were able to track it back to two men who were about the age that they thought this Golden State killer would be. One of the men followed the, he um, followed the physical description they had of the killer. So they followed him around until he publicly discarded a DNA sample. 
which might mean that he spit on the sidewalk or spit out gum. They collected his DNA sample. They compared it to the sample that they had in the file. They matched, they got a warrant for his arrest and he is now in prison. And since that time, dozens and dozens of cold cases have been solved. I should tell you that that sounds like a you know, wonderful, great use of DNA and I think it is. But there are some uses of DNA that are less, I would say, clear cut. So for example, there have been stories of young women who get pregnant in their teens, some of them at 14 or 15, oftentimes by a family member. They bring their baby to a safe place, you know, to a hospital, to a fire department and say, I can't take care of this baby anymore. But now, through DNA, that baby can be traced back to them. Um, and so we have to think as a society, are all of these uses good uses of DNA technology? And why are there so many rape kits sitting in storage that still have not been processed? I went through DNA testing myself through several of these companies so I could understand it better. And my raw data showed that I had a pathogenic finding for a condition called Lynch syndrome, which is hereditary colon, uterine and ovarian cancer. And so I got to feel firsthand what it's like to get those kind of results. It turns out that mine was a false positive, but I sure did put my family and my husband through a lot in those 30 hours until I could find that out. A lot of people ask me if I'm adopted, should I have DNA testing? And I think it's complicated. If you're looking for general family information or maybe some trade information about yourself, it can be interesting. You most likely can find some biological relatives, but I've learned from the adoptee community that many of these people reach out to blood relatives who didn't know they existed, like a biological grandmother or grandfather or siblings, and they are not always welcomed with opened arms. And for many of these people, they write about it feeling like a second time that they were rejected. Other people are reunited with relatives who are happy to know them and they develop relationships, but it's not straightforward. And I personally think that meeting with a genetic counselor before you do this might be helpful and instructive. We've also learned through this process that adoption, sperm, and egg donations are no longer anonymous. So for people who in college to earn money became sperm donors, now are learning that they have hundreds of biological children. And you can imagine that that might be complicated if you're now a 45 year old father of two, you thought, and suddenly you, your wife and your children that you've raised are learning that you have all of these half siblings. It can be really complicated. There are also some ways that genetic testing can be used that I think are worth knowing about. Um, for example, we know in China that DNA, and you know, it's interesting, it was many of these studies were done by a researcher at Yale who was tracking DNA differences among ethnic groups. And he and his wife did this over decades of time. And now that information is being used to track and detain Uyghurs, um, which is a Muslim group in re-education camps, which are being described as concentration camps in China and being they and they're separated from their families, they're being treated terribly. We also know that genetic testing has been used at the US-Mexico border and that that information is placed in FBI criminal databases, even though most of those people are not criminals and they don't meet the minimum criteria to be put in a criminal database. We also know that the CIA did vaccinations in Pakistan several years ago. And what they were really doing was collecting DNA to track down um, terrorists. And so imagine how well COVID vaccines are going in some of those areas that learned that they were duped and they weren't really getting vaccinations. So there are a lot of ways that genetic information has been 
um, misused. There have been warrants to search the GED match database, even for those who opted out of having their DNA used in this way. You know, JR was talking about some of the research that's being done, and I agree, some of it's really great research. But 23andMe participated in a study on homosexuality, and almost immediately, an app for how gay you are popped up in Uganda. And it's a country that was planning to make homosexuality punishable by death. Think about that. I also want you to think about how an app like that would go over at a slumber party where you wait till someone falls asleep and get their DNA, test it without their consent, and then on Instagram post that the seventh grader is gay. And I, I'm wondering what all of this does um, to suicide rates, to bullying, um, it concerns me. And that was a study that 23andMe felt important to take place in. We also know that the Pentagon has warned US military not to take these kits. And there are a lot of different reasons. One is that military, believe it or not, are excluded by the Genetic and Information Non-Discrimination Act they can be discriminated against based on their genetics. We don't know if they could be tested for some of these homosexuality genes. Um, we also don't know if undercover military agents in other areas could be identified by DNA and some of these other tools now being used for identification. And so I do think that genetic testing has great promise. If you have a personal or a family history of a genetic condition or a cancer or a condition you think could be genetic, I don't think using a direct to consumer test is your best bet. I think your best bet is to seek out a certified genetic counselor. You can find a certified genetic counselor by going to the National Society of Genetic Counselors homepage. It's nsgc.org and search find a counselor. And the great news is that even if you don't have a genetic counselor who lives geographically close to you, you will be able to find a genetic counselor you can speak to on the phone or that you can Zoom with because now all of this is being done um, by telehealth. So there are good options to help you understand your genetic testing options, pick the right test, and also help you interpret the information accurately and correctly. Great. Well, thank you, Ellen, for that uh, overview of all of the, the issues. We have about 15 minutes for, uh, you know, a few minutes for conversation. Um, folks can write into the chat if they have a, a question or a comment. Uh, we'll do those first. And then if there's other folks that want to speak up, we can unmute and do it. Uh, we do have one where uh, there's concern about disclosure, specifically with 23andMe. Um, worried about in terms of life insurance or other health coverage. Uh, can you, Ellen, maybe you can speak to what sort of disclosures you're obligated to, what sort of ones you have an option for and how that impacts insurance coverage? Sure, I think the answer is we don't really know how it impacts insurance coverage because we are not sure if direct to consumer testing is covered under GINA provisions. Um, and so we don't really know. In terms of life insurance, as you mentioned earlier, life insurers in most states can use your genetic testing information to, to pick a premium for you. That is allowable, although it doesn't happen often. Florida recently blocked that. Um, does that answer the question? I, I, I think it does from me. Um, uh, someone felt it was a bit of a, a sales pitch for genetic uh, counseling. Uh, Kate said it was interesting. Um, Can I that for a minute about JR. Um, yeah. it, it definitely was a sales pitch for genetic counseling. I think that if you're going to have genetic testing, it makes sense for you to be informed about it. Just for you to know, my company does not offer genetic counseling, but there are a lot of great genetic counselors 
um, in the United States and other countries. And it is a sales pitch. I think you should educate yourself. Cool. Uh, so that those are the questions that have been typed. Uh, was there anyone that had a, a, a question um, a question they wanted to ask vocally. I also see there are some. Uh, my mother, Kathleen, says a family tree not verified with DNA is mythology. So wisdom from a genealogist. And it looks like Rich, do you have a question? Yeah. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay. So how much does a, a full professional complete scan cost? So there's so many different types of genetic testing. If you wanted to go in and have a whole exome or whole genome testing at this point, that's not necessary for most people, but you could get that for a few thousand dollars. Um, if you only needed genetic testing for a specific condition, it could even cost a few hundred dollars. If you needed genetic testing, just for a genetic mutation found in your family, it could cost $100. And I should say that most insurance companies will pay for genetic testing when it is medically indicated, and that there are many programs available for people who don't have insurance coverage. Yeah, so for, for me, I, I shopped around and I found, uh, I did the full sequence. And one of the things, so you heard exome verse, uh, so exome is just measuring the things that are known to be coding on, and not the junk DNA. The whole, I did the whole genome. And then one of the things that you see noted is how many times it's read. So I did a whole genome 30 times, uh, which means that what the way they do is they break up the DNA into little chunks and they put it through this machine where they can read little segments. They can't read it all at once. And then they have to recombine the DNA uh, into by using a computer to see where the overlaps are. So just one read isn't enough. They need to read it like 30 times. And then to get rid of the errors, they're using error correction over time. So those are, um, those are the sorts of things you could look at. And what I, I haven't done it, but I plan to do is to take my 23andMe and cross-reference it with the one that I did the full sequence. And there I can uh, just spot check for myself, uh, knowing that there's gonna be some error in it. Uh, you know, it, it's a lot of, uh, it's, I, it's gigabytes. We're talking, I think it's 10 gigabyte file uh, when I did my whole genome. So it's a lot of opportunity for an error, um, but it's something I can verify because I've done it two ways. And when I did do the medical one, it was covered by insurance. I, I don't, you know, I'm sure I did a copay or something, but um, I'm curious about physician protocols. I have been a patient for 20 years with the same doctor as of a year ago, wants me to do genetic testing. Are they uh, beginning to push towards asking? I think that's for you, Ellen. Yeah. So there can be a couple of different reasons why your physician is recommending testing now and hadn't recommended it in the past. First of all, is that there are a lot of genetic tests that are new and that weren't previously available. It could also be that something in your personal or family history jogged his or her memory and made her think that um, you were a candidate for genetic testing. In terms of kickbacks, that's against the law. There's a stark law that prevents physicians from getting kickbacks for ordering tests for genetic testing or other tests. So I doubt that they have any incentive other than trying to get you the right test to suggest testing, but I don't know. Great. Uh, other questions from the group? I think I, I just saw a chat come in uh, with concerns about privacy and life insurance. Um, can you have testing done anonymously? That's a great question. When I first started at Yale in 1995, people were so concerned about what would happen with your genetic test results that you'd be discriminated against or your employer might fire you that I had people come in and give an alias and they would pay in cash. Um, I think since GINA, the Genetic Information Non-Disclosure Act or Non-Discrimination Act was passed, I think fewer people have been concerned about that. Um, in terms of anonymity, you could 
do testing anonymously, but not with your health insurance, of course. Um, I also am not sure I would recommend it because if you're truly doing it anonymously, it means that they would have no way to recontact you. Well, and it's hard to be not because it's a signature, right? It's a unique, um, if you run it through one of these things, I should be able to figure out if I had a, a missing sibling that was secret and they have a DNA, I, I might be able to uh, derive it from the data and uh, not know their name, but know they exist. Exactly. So Kara said not kickbacks, just like CDC recommendations. Yes, the Center for Disease Control and the NIH are making recommendations about who you should offer genetic testing to. So your physicians probably are getting increasingly pressured to suggest genetic testing to patients who need it. And if you think about it, that makes sense because rather than wait for your patient to develop ovarian cancer, it would, if they're at higher risk, it would be a lot better for them to learn about that ahead of time and know their options in terms of surveillance or risk reduction. So it makes a lot more sense to offer things preventatively whenever possible. Uh, opportunity for other questions from the group. You can unmute or type in. So it, uh, oh, mom, were you trying to talk? You're muted. You have to unmute if you're talking, but. Um, I was just going to say, I've had only positive experience with this DNA testing on every, almost every level that you mentioned. Um, JR has a new second cousin. My adopted son-in-law has a full family. Um, my both boys know they have hemochromatosis now. We also know that there's a carrier, two carriers with children. My grandchildren will have to be tested, but we know. And because there's an easy solution to it, and if it's not known, these, you can shorten your lifespan. I can't think of, oh, I even had a friend, a good friend who, never knew she had all these siblings because of her dad was a donor. He was a musician, um, decided to donate. And um, so she has a lot of brothers and sisters she didn't know about. And at first she was very upset. Her dad died when she was young. Hmm. Um, she kind of put him on a pedestal and she didn't quite know what to make of all this. But she's come around and they're all friends of hers on Facebook. And um, I think, I think it's all for the best. The truth is the best thing to deal with. Um, it's, and it's interesting, it's informative, it's helpful. Uh, I think the laws will have to learn to deal with ways of the, it's being used to discriminate, but I don't think that's a reason to fear. I think that's a reason to vote, mm. you know? Um, so that's Kathleen. my opinion. Yeah, no, I think in your family, from what you describe, it has been a huge success story. And there's no doubt like learning about hemochromatosis before you have any permanent damage to your eyes or your liver or other organs, of course, that's a success story. But for example, there was an article a few years ago called, I gave my parents 23 and me for Christmas and they gave me a divorce. So someone was able to learn that um, he had a sibling that no one else in the family knew about because of an affair. I think it's, um, I'm glad it's been positive for your family. I think that's fantastic, but I don't think it's positive for everyone who does it. It's also been really helpful as a family tree, because as I said with my statement, um, a family tree without DNA is mythology. It's, you find where it has been invented and where you actually have relatives. Um, it's been extremely interesting and very, very helpful. I can't imagine doing a family tree without it. And I can't imagine accepting somebody else's tree without verifying it. So, you know, it's, and, and family trees are interesting. They're a history of your genetics and, and what, what your family has been like. So, um, anyway, that's how I feel that I feel it's all very positive and the, a lot of the negativity that you feel it really comes down to laws and making basic laws that are where everyone is treated equally. 
Well, Kathleen, let me just say, I mean, I am a genetic counselor, so I am very positive about genetic testing. This is what I've spent my whole professional life doing. I was just today, my job was to show the juxtaposition, like mm -hmm. here are the positives and here are the poten potential negatives. I'll give you a recent story that really saddened me for one young woman. She had used donor sperm to have a biological child and she had um, had a baby, took that baby's DNA, sent it to 23andMe, found out that there was a relative willing to be contacted. So she contacted that relative. It was her baby's grandmother. The grandmother didn't know that her son had been a donor, not only was angry about that, but was furious that this woman contacted her. And so through her son, they contacted the sperm bank and took away the remaining sperm samples from that woman, even though she had paid for them, saying that she had violated their recontact policies. And now she can never have a matched sibling for her child. So it's not always positive. But I'm a huge fan of genetic testing, obviously. That's, that's why I went to graduate school for this. I just think we need to understand the risks and the benefits and the limitations. Yeah, so I think we are coming to the, uh, to the end, a good spot to, to wrap up. And uh, we have looked at uh, both sides of the coin and hopefully given folks uh, a little foundational, mostly correct knowledge about how DNA, if not incomplete, but how DNA works and uh, creates proteins and, and makes us who we are. It's the information system that, that runs our biology. So an incredible thing to observe and, and understand. And uh, I, I, uh, I am a, a booster of, of understanding this, obviously impacted my life in a big way. And uh, I am excited to share it. Ellen, did you have any closing um, comments as we wrap up? I don't think so. Thanks for joining us. It's been, it's been fun. Thank you. Thank you for coming. And, and thank you, everyone. I'll hang out for a minute after if folks have uh, specific questions um, about some of the tools and, and technical stuff.